Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I want to first of all want to appreciate every one of you for praying for me when I was in the hospital. I thank God I'm back to my feet. I'm going to share with us this morning about John Jonathan Edward. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, say who is Jonathan Edward? Jonathan Edward is an, is an evangelic, evangelist and he was born in October 5th, 1703. In this world, though, he is a man that was turned around the revival in his time. Uh, I want to say during his uh, school, during his uh, undergraduate in, 19, in 1706, 1716, to 1720, and he graduated his study in 1721 and uh, in 1722 at Yale College. Edward was engaged in contemporary issue, issues in theology and philosophy. He studied the debate between the Orthodox and uh, quickly, let me just go through what uh, is doing this a revival in his time. Oh, that is fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And uh, at Yale, Edward wrote almost exclusive on a natural philosophy and metaphysics, simultaneously with and yet distinct from the great English dialects. In 1726, it was his grandfather, Solomon Stouffer, as the pastor, as the pastor of the church in North Park, Massachusetts, the largest and most influential church outside of Boston, turning his attention from the theological pursuit of his of his early years to more practical matters. He got married to Sarah in 1727. Success, your voice is breaking. Uh, can you recheck your network, please? Is it clear for everyone or it's only for me? The voice is breaking. Everyone in the class able to hear success. Yes. 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 Now, I want to Now we can hear you, but before that, your voice was breaking and we could not, you were, you were not audible. Yes. I think it's network, Just let me check my network, please. Uh, just give me two minutes. Let me restart my network because the network is very high. Uh, Sorry, just give me two you're minutes. good now. Actually, we are able to hear you now. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm good now. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Thank you so much on that. I'm trying to get my distance. Okay, as I was saying, what are the first to work? I said earlier that he became a pastor when he succeeded his grandfather Solomon Status as a church pastor. The first thing in 1734 to 1735, Edward oversaw some of the initial steering of the first a great working. He gained international fame as fame as a revivalist and theologian of the arts after publishing a faithful narrative of a surviving work of God that happened in 1738, which is described as great are working in his church and serve as empire model for American and British revivalists alike. 
in in 1740s simultaneous can you hear me this network is getting problems yes oh you can hear me right yes. now the first and greatest hometown american philosopher edward in his time he thought highly of his wife as as uh, when he was as young when he was young there are 10 things i noticed about him that i want to capture that everyone know number one he came from a large family with a pastoral heritage that's when he was born in east adults secondly edward jonathan he was a conversation and work of satisfaction came through the struggle everything about him initially was a struggle for him sanctification was a struggle from his childhood was a struggle that can be seen in 1721 number three he pastored his first church when he was 18 years old as major at ease to tell you that god actually want to use him number five his largest tenor in ministry was serving as assistant and then pastor of a church in his own time. That can be seen in August 29, 1726. In February 15, 1727, he was ordained. And on 11, 1729, Stafford died and Edward became a pastor of the church. Number six, he was a key player in the first great awakening. And this awakening turned around the U U U.S. then and England. The church where he served, the long fired him. And I asked, why did they fire him with such anointing? That happened on June 22nd, 1750. Edward was voted out of his pastoral in his time. Several reasons are cited of his dismissal. He requested for an increase of salary. He and Sarah had 11 children. He responded to the burning among the youth. He summoned on the back books and public education of the innocent. Some young men had gained access to the midwife manual that contains image of his female atomy and use it to touch, to teach the, children, the young women in town. So about 20, 230 men who voted, only 23 stood in his favor. So that is why he was voted out. He served as a missionary to the Indians and the president of Princeton before his death. That can be seen in my in 1751. Lastly, on that note, before lastly on that note, he wrote an astonished numbers of books on a vastity of subjects. They found they would have found 73 volumes listed. Why many of these volumes contain a Simon, the literacy input Edward produced that happened in India? Now, what are his legacy? His legacy of knowing and delighting in the glory of God restores in the church today. He's a man of fire and he will serve and he will do well. For him. I want to talk lastly on the mission post. In his own time, he went to the mission post of Stock Bridge on the western border. At the same time, where he served from 1951 to 1957, he pastored a small English congregation, was a missionary to the 150 family, and he wrote many of major work, including those that address the one. Now, I want to talk about his miracle. What he did do during his time, he preached salvation. And uh, many believe in him. I think that's all that I can do right now because I do I couldn't find my flash here. 
But actually, I will send the flash as soon as I get back to the office because it's compressing if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Enoch, uh, for sharing on Jonathan Edwards. And it was amazing. Um, yeah. So, uh, yes, when we look into Jonathan Edwards' life, we also see he was a very influential man and he was a man of highly intellectual character of uh, one among the America, American Americans and he was uh, widely read in the British Isles. So in, in a general revolt against Puritanism and Calvinism after the American Civil War. So uh, Edward's prestige, uh, uh, you know, was declined and he was remembered mainly as a hellfire preacher. And he was a uh, uh, he was an uh, like just like a, what Enoch said. He was he preached his messages or his sermons was like fire mer among the American minds. Uh, yeah, thank you, Enoch, for sharing on Jonathan and Edwards. And have we left out anyone? Is there anyone yet to um, share the presentation? Prisi, are you ready with your presentation? Yeah, yeah, everyone can go ahead and share your uh, uh, views or feedback on the presentation of Enoch. It was wonderful. Thanks, Enoch, for sharing. Pracy, uh, is your presentation ready? Would you like to present? Okay. <clears throat> um, okay. Maybe for some problem, Tracy is not able to respond. We will continue with our class uh, today. Okay. Today we're going to study on another person. Okay, David Livingston. Let me present share the presentation. Give me a minute. Okay, the presentation is seen. Okay, so today we're going to discuss our, on David Livingston. He was an explorer, missionary, and an anti-slavery campaigner. He became a great hero of the Victorian era for his epic discoveries uh, in the heart of the unexplored Africa. So he sent the last six years, he spent uh, the last six years of his life almost, um, you know, cut off from the outside world. And he lived among the tribal, the African people. And he... Uh, and literally, the way he connected with them or he developed a, a relationship with them, he literally refused to uh, leave uh, Africa for any reason. So if you look at his early life, David Livingstone was born on 21st March of 1813 in the mill town of Blantyre. Lanarkshire, Scotland. Uh, 
His father was a committed Protestant Sunday school teacher who took a literal interpretation of the Bible. So we see that his father's religious influence played a, a key role in influencing the young David as he grew up where with an aspiration to become a missionary of himself. So from a very early age, we see that David was fascinated with geology, science, and the natural world. So due to his father's influence, he worried that science might conflict with religion. But however, after reading Thomas Dick's philosophy of a future state, David was able to reconcile religion with science. So due to his family's poverty, we see that David had to work long hours in a local cotton mill from the age of 10 to 26. At a very young age, we see that he started working to provide or to meet the needs of his family. So despite the long hours, he found himself to study after work. So his work in the mill imbued him with a classic Protestant work ethic. So this experience left him with respect and empathy for workers and worker slaves. So in 1836, he entered Anderson's College in Glasgow to train as a medical missionary. So due to the outbreak of war in China, it was suggested that David traveled to Africa to work as a missionary there. So this is how he moved to Africa. So David Livingstone enthusiastically traveled to Africa where he strengthened his ideals of becoming a Christian missionary, searching for a greater scientific discovery improved commerce and the abolition of slavery. So one of his quote, he says that, I cannot love of Christ, can't the love of Christ carry the missionary where the slave trade carries the trader? So I shall open up a path to the interior or perish. So what happened? However, in Africa, he realized the difficulty of making converts to Christianity. So during the 1840s, he gained only one real convert of Christianity. Just imagine, out of all his hard work, there's only one person that he could transform or he can make him to receive Christ. But then what happened later? We see that he also narrowly survived death after being mauled by a lion. In forty-five, in 1845, he married Dr. Robert Moffat's eldest daughter, Mary. Although Mary had lived in Africa since she was four, she did not share her hundred, I mean, husband's interest in exploration. Although they had six children, David spent little time with his family especially towards the end of his life. So his wife, Mary, came to suffer from alcoholism. And David admitted uh, that one regret he had was that he didn't spend more time with his family. So these are small things that we can learn from different missionaries. Like, yes, as we serve the Lord and or as we serve in the mission field, we need to pay equal attention to our family as well, you know, because uh, our family should not suffer. And yeah, we need to pray and uphold them so that they will also share the same love or same uh, zeal towards mission and see to it that, you know, as a family, we serve alongside, um, you know, in the mission field, serve God in the mission. Well, after this initial period, David Livingston increasingly turned his attention to the exploration of the African continent, which was largely unexplored by the Westerns. So we see that uh, uh, David Livingstone renamed uh, the waterfall, the waterfall that was there uh, um, as a Victorian Falls in honor of Queen Victoria. So in 1854 to 56, he made the first successful 
transcontinental uh, journey across Africa from Launda on the Atlantic to Kulenma on the Indian Ocean. Okay, so we see that some of the uh, uh, great success of David Livingston as an explorer, partly uh, uh, because of his ability to get on with the local tribal chiefs. So he traveled lightly without soldiers and his non-confrontational approach made it easier for him to be welcomed among the African tribals. So uh, the, uh, uh, the, he was uh, he was in a very good relationship. Uh, he was uh, he was welcomed by the African tribal. So this became a good foundation for him to start sharing or preaching the Christian message. But it did not force uh, uh, the uh, chief tribal. To accept it, so like some of the some of his contemporaries. So, however, although he had good qualities in enduring himself to the locals, he was less praised by the fellow members of his own uh, uh, group. So, he was often criticized for his poor leadership and judgment. So, being subject to the different moods and intolerant of criticism, his fellow physician like. John Kirk said of Livingston that I can come to no other conclusion than Dr. Livingstone is out of his mind and a most unsafe leader. These were some of the quotes that his own fellow members commented about him. But nothing stopped David from ministering to the Africans. So what happened? Um, the other members of the Livingstone servants later expressed admiration for the uh, for the determination of Livingstone had in the times of difficulty, and even when he was sick, he continued to minister among the Africans. So, at the end of 1850, we see that he resigned from the London Missionary Society to do it more time to uh, exploration. So, he received a commission from the Royal Geography Society, and this helped fund an exploration of River Zamb Zambzi. So, what happened? So in 1866, we see that David Livingstone returned to Africa for a mission to discover the source of the Nile. So he never quite attended the goal, but it helped him to fulfill in details about the great lakes of Lake Tanganyika and Lake Meru. So Livingstone also helped to identify some of the lakes there. And unfortunately, on his expedition, he again lost helpers due to illness or desertion. He also had supplies stolen. And this required him to depend on the help of the slave traders, which annoyed him. So as he was in the uh, serving period, um, he suffered a variety of tropical illness due to the weather and the living condition there throughout his life. So David Livingston, he died on the mission field with a, a dysentery. And on May 1st, 1872, at the age of 59, he passed away. And he was known as a man of prayer as he was serving among the slave trade when he wants to abolish the slave trade among Africans he ministered to them and in his ministry he was a man of prayer people uh, the uh, the Africans noticed him always kneeling next to his bed and praying with his hands joined so even when he passed away he passed away knelt in prayer this is how he was in the position when he passed away. And the local um, African attendants, like some of them who were very loyal to David Livingston, some of the names um, are listed, but I'm not able to pronounce it correctly. Let me try, like Chuma, Souza, Naisa, uh, Kyopre, were somewhat reluct reluctant to give up on Livingstone. So in the end, they say, like, you know, David. Livingstone, um, you know, he had no reason. Uh, he was so attached to Africans and the slaves, the tribal people who lived there, that they said his heart 
was connected here. He had no reason that he will leave this place. But then when there was a demand that his uh, body need to be carried back to England, but the locals came up saying that no matter where you can carry his body, but his heart will be for the Africans. So, you know, this is what they did at the end. They cut out his heart and they buried it in a uh, buried it in Africa saying that it is a uh, and they they commemorated with saying special memorial at the village called uh, Ailala near the edge of Bangwe which is in Zambia so his body was taken to the coast where it was put in a ship to England and his body was buried at Westminster Abbey Abbey at England. So this is the story of David Livingstone. With that, we will move on to the next person. Let me change the slide. Yeah, this is some of the quote that David Livingston shared. If you have men who will only come if they know that there is a good road. I don't want them. I want men who will come if there is no road at all. So here he's talking about the simple attitude of serving. You know, we need to step in with the heart of serving, not knowing the comfort. Yeah. And there's also another beautiful quote shared by David Livingstone is, I would rather be in the heart of Africa in the will of God than on the throne of England out of the will of God. So we, from these quotes, we could make out this love towards the Africans and the tribal people among whom he served during his last period before his death. Yeah, with that, we will move on to Hudson Taylor. Yeah, <clears throat> Hudson uh, Taylor was a missionary to China. He was also a German evangelical Lutheran missions. He formed it in 1843. And uh, uh, his full name is James Hudson Taylor. And he was a British Protestant Christian missionary to China and the founder of the China uh, Inland Mission, which is in short known as CIM now OMF International. It's known as OMF International. So Taylor spent 51 years in China. The society that he began was responsible for bringing over 800 missionaries to the country who had who began 125 schools and directly resulted in 18,000 Christian conversion, as well as the establishment of more than 300 stations of work with more than 500 local helpers in all 18 provinces. So Taylor was known for a sensitivity to Chinese culture and zeal for evangelism. So he adopted wearing native Chinese clothing, even though this was rare among missionaries of that time. So under his leadership, we see that the CIM, what is the full form of CIM? China Inland Mission. Okay, the CIM was singularly non-denomination national in practice and accepted members from all Protestant groups, so including individuals from the working class and single women as well as the multinational recruits, primarily because of the CMI's camping against the opium trade. So Taylor has been referred to as one of the most significant Europeans to visit China in the 19th century. So now we see that there's no other missionary in the 19th century since the Apostle Paul had a wider vision and had carried out a more systematic plan of the evangelizing on a broader ge geographical area than Hudson Taylor. We see that Taylor uh, was able to preach in several varieties of Chinese, including um, uh, Mandarin, Chaozhou, and Uf dialects of Shanghai and Ningbo. The last of these he knew well enough to help prepare a, a collo collo colloquial edition of the New Testament written in it. 
Um, well, if you look out his early days, Taylor was born on 21st May 1832, and he was a son of a chemist and a Methodist lay preacher, James Taylor and his wife, Amelia. So as a young man, he ran away from the Christian beliefs of his parents. Well, at 17, after reading an evangelical tract, uh, or a pamphlet titled Poor Wretched, he professed faith in Christ. And in December 1849, he committed himself to going to China as a missionary. And at this time, he came into contact with Edward Corrin of Ken uh, Kensington. So one of the members of this first missionary, missionary party of the uh, Plymouth Brethren to Baghdad. So it is believed that Taylor learned his faith on mission principles from his contact with the brethren. And Taylor was able to borrow a copy of China. So in uh, we see that he quickly read that about this time and he began studying the languages of some of the Chinese language way. He was preparing himself to go and minister at China. So we see that along with this desire, he, he, he started to prepare to fulfill the vision that God has uh, or fulfill the purpose that God has put in his heart. So we see that Taylor left England on 19 September in um, 1853 before completing his medical studies. He departed from Liverpool and arrived to Shanghai, China. So on 1st March 1854, nearly um, there was a disastrous voyage abroad, the Clipper Dumfries, through an early passage near Buru Island, lasted about five months. So in China, he was immediately uh, was faced with a civil war, throwing his first year there uh, into turmoil. So Taylor made 18 preaching tours in the vicinity of Shanghai starting in 1855 and was often poorly received by the people of China. Even though he was brought with his medical supplies and skills, he made a decision to adopt the native Chinese clothes and, and the pigtail with, sh uh, with sh uh, shaven forehead and was then able to gain an audience without creating a disturbance. So it is very important, you know, the outlook of a person to uh, to minister to people or to a different set of audience, um, you know, um, yeah, just like what uh, Paul said, like, you know, to a Roman, be a Roman, to a Jew, be a Jew. Yes, our, our attire, the way we portray ourselves also matters when it comes to sharing the gospel. So previous to this, Taylor realized that whatever he went, he was being referred to as a black devil because of the overcoat he wore. So he distributed thousands of Chinese gospel tracts and the portions of scriptures in and around Shanghai. And during his stay in Shanghai, he also adopted and cared for a Chinese boy named Han Ban. So Scottish evangelist uh, uh, William Clamour Burns of the uh, English Presbyterian Mission began work in Shanto. Um, you see that uh, how he ministered in this area and he was received well by these people. Just give me a minute. Um, yeah. He was received well uh, by the people. And in 1858, we see that Taylor married Maria Jane Dyer, the orphaned daughter of the Reverend Dyer of the London Missionary Society, who had been a pioneer missionary to Chinese in Penang, Malaysia. So Hudson met Maria in Ningbo, where she lived and worked at a school for girls, which was run by one of the first female missionary to the Chinese, uh, that was Mary Ann Albersey. So as a married couple, now the Taylors took care of an adopted boy named Tianxi, while living in Ningbo. 
nimble. Um, they had a baby of their own that died late in 1858 and their first surviving child was Grace who was born in 1859. Shortly after she was born, Taylor's took over all of the operations at the hospital in Ningbo that had been run by William Parker. So in a letter to his sister, Amelia Hudson, Taylor, he wrote on 14th Feb 1860, he says like this, if I had a thousand pounds, China should have it. If I had a thousand lives, China should have them. No, not China, but Christ. Can we do too much for him? Can we do enough for a pressure? Can we do enough for a, a for such a precious savior? So, because of his health problem in 1860, Taylor decided to return to England for a furlough with his family. The Taylor sailed back to England and brought to a, uh, to the T Clipper Jubilee along with their daughter Grace and a young man. Um, Van Lounge from the Bridge Street Church in Ningbo, who would help with the Bible translation work uh, that would continue in England. Yeah, so this is how he ministered to the people uh, in China. And Taylor used his time in England to continue his work with the company, uh, to continue his work in the translation of the New Testament and to publish in the, uh, uh, in the Chinese language, which in, uh, in turn can continue the mission work that he started at China. So we see his character. He was more uh, mission and evangelical, where he embraced the members of all leading denomination of the Christians. And the methods uh, were somewhat a very um, peculiar, which he adopted, where newly proposed organization, where he qualified the candidates for the mission work. He chose the young ones, and he shared the word of God with them, and he encouraged them uh, with the missionary to carry a missionary mindset and he sent them on missions so this was something new in those days and he also supported many mission or the lord's people uh, willingly whoever uh, will to serve in the mission field he supported them financially and we also see that due to his health condition taylor remained in switzerland and uh, you know with his uh, wife and in 1900 um not in 1900 sorry yeah taylor returned yeah, later he also returned to China for the 11th and the final time to visit and see how the mission fields in China is growing and how the people whom he appointed are ministering to. And later, due to his health condition, he passed away. Um, yeah, so this is what about Hudson Taylor is all about. So with that, we can move on to the next person, but I see the time is not sufficient for us to move on. But then we could also see some of the revivals uh, during the same period that was happening. Let me, let me check that, yeah. Happening in different places. Okay, so in 1857 to 1858, we also see the layman's prayer revival that took place in New York. So what happened in this revival? It was a revival that was biggest and widespread revival in American history, where it began as a, in a small uh, noonday prayer meeting with about six people. So in a matter of months, this team grew for two 10,000 people meeting for prayer. And this spread across America, and it estimated 1 million people converted, and another 1 million revived over a two-year period. And this was led by the laymen across the America. And we see that the revival that started in New York in 1857, it affected several other parts of the world uh, You know, at the same time, which includes Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Britain, Germany, 
Germany, Sweden, Netherlands, and the West Indies, also affecting South Africa, India, and Indonesia. So this period, in 1857 to 1861, we, you know, the world saw the revival breaking out globally, almost everywhere. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, almost everywhere at the same time and it seemed to be spreading like fire so in 1859 we see that the revival in uh, U ulster province which is in northern ireland hearing reports of the revival in new york the church in ireland was stirred with a great hunger for revival. So in September of 1857, four young men named James McCulkin, John Wallace, Robert Cardsley, Jeremiah Menesley in Ulster, Northern Ireland, committed themselves to praying for revival. So over the course of 1858 and Toward early 1859, many more prayer groups started praying for the revival. So it is estimated about 104 prayer groups all over the city of Ulster were praying almost day and night for the revival. So we say that uh, James McCulkin organized a bigger prayer meeting on almost day and night for revival. So uh, he, he organized a prayer meeting in March 14th, 1859, and that was attended by 300 people standing in the rain and mud. They were gripped by the power of the Holy Spirit where nothing could disturb them or could uh, you know, move away from that meeting due to rain. So during the message, there was a lay man who was preaching for about 100 people, fell to the ground under the conviction of sin. Tears streamed down many faces as people confessed their sins, crying out to the Lord. And there was a revival fire that it was so much visible, they ignited and began spreading into the homes and marketplaces. So on May 17th, the whole town was under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. So people were meeting for prayer everywhere in small groups. And we see men, women, children broke down crying with strong physical manifestation and getting saved. So we see the Spirit of the Lord move among them very vibrantly. There was a tangible presence of God. We, we also notice that the children prayed with great power. Revival spread through various countries. And, um, you know, uh, at Broad Chain, a factory was closed for two days as 20 of its workers lay down on the floor crying out to God. A country fair where 5,000 people were present turned into a prayer meeting. We also see homes and families were restored as lives were changed. So in Belfast, a large distillery closed and whiskey trade dropped. We also see pubs closed. Judges had no cases to try and often there were no prisoners in the custody. So we also saw some of the previous revivals that spread, uh, you know, where the police, the judges had no work. So some of the same things that happened or repeated in the revival when the Lord moved was the crime rate was dropped down. Drive down, drop down, and the Lord convicted the sin of the people. There was a cry for change, a cry for the new life among the people. And you know, they were one lakh uh, people or more than that. People
people were convicted and they joined the church. We see the church expanded and grew. We see people yearn for more of God. So these are certain things that happened during the time in the revival. And this revival prayer just didn't stop. It continued. It also reached the Wales in 1859. Like that was happening in Northern Ireland. People in Wales also engaged in prayer across the country. And we see that God used two men, uh, Humphrey Jones, who had returned to Wales after two years. So in America. And we also see David Morgan, who was a Calvinistic Methodist preacher, who heard Humphrey Jones preach and he began working with them. So God used these two men to fuel the flames of revival through their preaching. Many people or many people were convicted out of their sin and they were saved. We also see the, uh, the revival fire just didn't minister to the elderly or elderly people or the adults. We also see children were touched. They were crying. They were filled with the tangible presence of God. And we see the revival broke in about 40 coal miles at the same time. So the ministers and the churches were revived across the Wales. And we see how powerfully the Holy Spirit moved in this season. It also reached Scotland and England. When the news of what was happening in North America and Northern Ireland, it reached Scotland. The church in Scotland began to pray and ask God for a similar outpouring. Say the church could only pray like this when the Holy Spirit ministers to them. So the minute they started crying out and praying, you see a revival fire broke in Scotland and in England. So uh, the people were reported to attend the weekly prayer for revival. So in addition, there were about 1,205 prayer meetings that were birthed. And this revival was across the interdenomination prayer meetings. People were no more into the denomination mind. They just came out of that they were meeting in groups they were just started to pray and cry out to god they were convicted of their sin and they wanted more of god there was um, you know sudden urge or passion or zeal to know more about god and they were yearning for more of him and they started forming small groups where they could pray and seek god so this is what was happening, uh, where there was a rise of people joining the church and the, uh, the people we added every day to the church. And this is how uh, the revival broke in different places in North America, England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and the other places. Yeah. So with that, we will stop for today's session and we can pray and ask God how these lay people, just in form of small groups, uh, the thirst or the urge for revival, they just prayed, Lord, revive me. Help me to carry that revival fire. And this passion spread throughout. Can we all pray in that way? Dear God, we thank you. We praise you. Father, as we studied about the revivalist and the revivals, how the lay people prayed, and there was a revival that broke out, the revival fire burst throughout the world, Lord, in different places, oh, Father. People were convicted of their sin. Churches were birthed. Church People were added to the church. Lord, I pray that, Lord, we come as we are, Lord, into your hands. We submit ourselves, Lord. We pray that you will revive us, Lord, for us to be, for us to carry that revival fire in our time, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you for reviving us. Thank you, Lord, for increasing us to carry that fire, to carry the zeal to know more about you, to spread, the, uh, to spread, to share the gospel about you to everyone around us, Lord, to spread the love of Christ to people around us, oh, Father. Help us to be the carrier of your word, carrier of your light, carrier of your fire. Spirit of the living God, you move on among us, Lord, despite the place where we are, Spirit of the living God, 
change us, change our mind, change our heart. Help us to carry the passion for your word, for your spirit, Lord. Help us to be the carrier of your fire, which could ignite the world for you, O Father. Help us to be that carrier, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for doing it so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. God bless. These are some of the quotes of Hudson Taylor. Well added. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, each one, for joining in today's session. God bless. Yeah. Thank you. Amen.